from the book of John, chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. I want to talk about a subject that every one of us is probably, well, there's no probably, that surely is familiar with, and that subject is failure. We have all known it. It's part of being human. Who out there among us doesn't cringe at the memory of a failed relationship or a failed plan or a project. And while all of our failures haven't been terribly devastating, failures always leave at least a sting. And the Bible is full of people who fail. In fact, if you think about it, it all starts with Adam and Eve there in the garden. And it just continues on from one generation to the next. Well, let's look at Nicodemus. Nicodemus, we know, was a Pharisee, and Pharisees were teachers and rulers of the Jewish people. And for the most part, they were hostile, very hostile toward Jesus. But Nicodemus was different. He was just among a small handful of those in Jerusalem who had seen the signs of Jesus, his miracles, his teachings, his healings, his exorcisms. And they were intrigued. In fact, Nicodemus was so impressed that one night he came to where Jesus was staying. Now, there's been a whole lot made of the fact that he went by night. And some speculate he didn't want to be seen, particularly by his fellow Pharisees. But we got to remember that in John's Gospel, light and dark are spiritual categories. Jesus... John tells us, is the light that shines in the darkness. So for Nicodemus to come by night suggests that he's moving away from the moral and spiritual darkness and toward the light of Christ. He doesn't believe in Jesus, but he comes and he wants to know more. And Jesus, Jesus is more than willing to provide. Truly, truly, Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, what? He was incredulous. Born again? How can an old man like me be born again? It's not like you can go back up into your mother's womb and come out a second time. That's absolutely absurd. Well, of course, we know that he's right. But we're not talking about biology this morning. In Greek, the word for again is anothen. And anothen can also mean from above. And that's the way that Jesus meant it. He was thinking in spiritual terms and in spatial terms of being born of God above. But Nicodemus is stuck with his earthly definition. 
So, of course, he just didn't get it. But Jesus persists, and he takes another direction in order to explain this new birth required for the kingdom. And he says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, in the Jewish tradition, the spirit is equated with life. In creation, you'll remember, the spirit hovered over the chaos. When Adam was born, if you will, God breathed his spirit into him, and Adam became a living being. Remember in Ezekiel, Israel is portrayed as dry bones strewn all over the valley floor, but then the nation is reborn when God puts breath into those bones. You would think that a Bible scholar, like Nicodemus was, would know all of this, and he would get the point. To be born again, or from above, is to be born of God by that Spirit. But poor old Nicodemus, he just doesn't get it. So Jesus chides him a little bit, and he says, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? And Jesus keeps going and doesn't give up. He says, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. Well, what Jesus knows and what he has seen, and he goes on to say, are heavenly things. Heavenly things. And he talks about that. And he says to him, he knows them because he is the son of man who has come down, descended from heaven. And he has done that so that he might be lifted up. And that is both crucified and exalted, so that those who believe in him might have salvation. In effect, what he's doing is saying to Nicodemus, to be born of God, to enter the kingdom of heaven, is to believe in me, is to trust in me, and is to follow me. And unfortunately, that's where the relationship and the encounter between Nicodemus at this point and Jesus ends. And while it doesn't say so in the text, I have this image of Nicodemus trudging back home in the dark, kind of scratching his head, kind of baffled about what he had just heard. So the question is, why didn't Nicodemus understand He's a biblical scholar. He's supposed to be attuned to God. And yet he doesn't understand who Jesus is and what he's doing. Why is the question. Well, several people a lot smarter than I think it's because he suffers from a failure of imagination. Nicodemus is so stuck in one particular view of God and how God works that he just cannot imagine anything different. And he fails to see God doing something remotely new in this Jesus person. We see this failure of imagination in his view of Jesus. When Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he's very complimentary. You heard his words. Rabbi, he says, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. But he realizes that Jesus is something more than just a teacher. He says a teacher come from God and one whose powerful work suggests God is with him. For him, anyone, anyone who did the kind of miracles Jesus did had to be considered empowered by God. And even when Jesus identifies himself as the son of man who has come from God, Unlike anybody else in history, Nicodemus still can't wrap his arms around who Jesus is. He can't imagine Jesus being anything more than a great teacher and a miracle worker. Over the years, we have been told that the idea of God returning to earth is archaic. It's the stuff of fairy tales, Greek legends, and myths. To suggest Jesus was in, in, incarnate is, we're told, a remnant of a less sophisticated time and less sophisticated people. You know, this is high-tech age. 
We're techies. This isn't really in keeping with who we are and where we are. Well, like Nicodemus, people don't get Jesus because they can't conceive of him being anything more than a very godly person, a good teacher, and a powerful worker. They suffer from a failure of imagination because they don't or won't or can't imagine a God big enough to work outside of the little boxes that we put him in. Consider another failure of imagination. One argument against the resurrection of Jesus is that no one else was or has been raised from the dead. The thinking goes like this. Since we don't know of anyone else who has been raised, Jesus couldn't have been raised. That, they say, is the way the world works. Well, unfortunately, they can't imagine that Jesus' resurrection might be unique because his purpose and his person is unique. They can't imagine God working outside the box of their own assumptions. More than 60 years ago, the author J.B. Phillips wrote a little book. The title of it was, Your God is Too Small. And in it, he addressed this failure of our imagination. And he didn't use those terms, but he suggested that so often our image of God limits our ability to understand him. He said, if we see God as a moral policeman, then we won't be able to experience his mercy and his graciousness. And if we see God as an old man on a throne, we cannot grasp the way that he continues to work in the world. In essence, we do put God in a box and we define what God can and cannot do. But that God is too small. The God we worship is a powerful and a surprising God. One that creates and restores and transforms. The God we worship comes as a child. He dies on a cross and he rises from a tomb. The God we worship gives birth to his children. That's us and loves us and guides us and corrects us and welcomes us home. The God that we worship, friends, is larger than any box than which we try to put him. And to see our God, to appreciate what he's done, to understand what he can do, forces us to look beyond the limits which we impose upon him and to imagine what he can do for those of us who really love him. But that night in Jerusalem, Nicodemus couldn't do it. Somewhere between that night, though, and the cross, he did. Because on the day that Jesus died, Nicodemus was there, not as an accusing Pharisee, nor as a curious inquirer, but he was there as a man who had come to love Jesus so much that he joined Joseph of Arimathea in removing Christ's body and placing it there in the tomb. And while the text doesn't say so, again, I can imagine Nicodemus walking home that night and recalling the light that Jesus had shined into the darkness of his life and thinking that just maybe the story wasn't quite over yet and that God had something bigger and even more surprising plan. Folks, we are so lucky. We have over 2,000 years to look back, to look back through history to the time of Christ and see how wondrously God has worked since Nicodemus. We are so lucky. So I urge you, I urge you this morning, open that box. Let your imagination go. Give God the ability to have all the power that he has. And I stand here before you this morning telling you with that power, he's going to bless each and every one of us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.